<laughs> All right, sir. Hello, everyone. I'm Scott Koenigbauer. I'm a PhD candidate at Purdue University in Thomas Hook's lab. Uh, thank you all for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, today, myself and Ryan Darton from NOAA, uh, just nearby in Ann Arbor, are going to talk about present and future habitat restorations in Lake Huron. Okay, so uh, many of you are likely familiar that Saginaw Bay reefs are degraded. So Saginaw Bay is classified as an area of concern by the US EPA um, and one of the many beneficial use impairments of the AOC are degradation of the benthos and benthic habitats for fish. Um, so image, to, I guess it's pretty dark on the screen. Image to the right, you can basically see some remnant reefs um, that are roughly covered by up to one meter of sediment, especially at Corian Reef. Um, so this is a huge issue, obviously, for fish populations throughout Saginaw Bay. Uh, Alex Gatch was a master's student at Purdue between 2018 and 2019, and in collaboration with U.S. Geological Survey, uh, Great Lakes Science Center, he developed a couple of different uh, remediation tools or towable um, sediment removal devices, and we deployed them throughout Saginaw Bay to see how effective it would be to actually remediate some of this, um, I guess, uh, sedimentation covering these remnant reefs. And ultimately what we found is, yes, these, these types of tools may be useful in certain uh, applications. However, when you're talking roughly a meter of sediment covering your remnant site, they be, may be less effective. Um, also with Alex Gatch, we worked together to um, basically demonstrate the effect of even just a small amount of siltation or sedimentation on the survival of different fish embryos. And so we used walleye in the lab and essentially found here along the Y axis is just hatchability or percent walleye eggs hatched. Um, and we treated with different amounts of silt cover and found that even just two millimeters or even four millimeters of silt can roughly have the survival rate of eggs. So clearly when we see this much sediment, on these benthic habitats where fish like to spawn, we can expect this likely has a serious implication for the survival um, or recruitment of the population. Oops. Right, so restoration of these habitats, um, of these reef habitats represent an opportunity um, for potential improvements of the fisheries, not only in Saginaw Bay, but greater Lake Huron. Um, so I'm going to cover sort of a history of Purdue University's research of reefs throughout Saginaw Bay. Um, it's 2024 now, so this is roughly a 10-year program or a one-decade program that's occurred. Um, so just a brief roadmap. We started in 2014 um, with some pre-restoration surveys. So I'll go through that pre-restoration survey. I'll talk a little, about, a little bit about the restoration of Corian Reef, an offshore reef uh, nearby in Saginaw Bay. Um, my surveys as a PhD student of that constructed reef and I'll also touch a little bit on some more pre-restoration surveys and future reef restorations in Saginaw Bay as well. Um, when Purdue University conducts these reef restoration surveys or these spawning utilization surveys, we have three main targets that we like to um, sort of assess. So we're interested in the presence and spawning uh, utilization of lake whitefish in the fall and uh, walleye in the spring. Um, and so we'll capture those with overnight gill nets, as well as uh, quantify egg deposition rates using benthic egg mats. Um, we're also interested in potential egg predators, the assemblage of egg predator fish species present in a given area. And so for that, we'll also use gill nets uh, and we will look at diets to determine whether or not they're actually consuming our target spawner um, eggs. And then finally, we're also trying to sort of assess the egg incubation environment as well. So um, we often deploy dissolved oxygen um, loggers over time, as well as take profiles throughout each uh, sampling. And of course, we'll also try to visually assess sedimentation and structural change of the reefs or the habitats as well. Um, so quickly, between 2014 through 2016, a master's student at Purdue named Nick Calais conducted these pre-restoration surveys throughout Saginaw Bay. So this was before any reef restoration had occurred in the area, and it was trying to help inform maybe where a good location or candidate location would be for a reef restoration. Um, so he surveyed four different sites um, right at the Saginaw River mouth, um, Corian Reef, which is roughly 10 miles offshore, um, and then a couple 
uh, closer to outer Saginaw Bay remnant reef sites, Duck Reef and North Island Reef. Um, what he found essentially using that same suite of different survey objectives I just covered were that both walleye and lake whitefish could or were spawning at all of these degraded habitats. However, a general pattern both through spawner presence as well as egg deposition was that walleye tended to spawn quite a bit at this Corian reef site and lake whitefish um, generally sort of habituated uh, the outer more reefs such as North Island and Duck Reef. Um, at all of these unrestored sites, there were multiple egg predators present, uh, predominantly channel catfish, common carp, white sucker, and yellow perch. Um, and another sort of interesting and maybe concerning finding was through Nick's surveys, his overwinter dissolved oxygen loggers detected some potential for overwinter hypoxia. So if there were overwinter hypoxia, that would be particularly concerning for species like Lake Whitefish, whose eggs incubate through the winter. Um, so following that pre-restoration survey based on um, stakeholder meetings, some sedimentation modeling, uh, as well as potentially informed by those pre-restoration fish utilization surveys, um, a group determined that Corian Reef was the first site that would be restored in Saginaw Bay. Um, so again, that reef is positioned roughly 10 miles from the mouth of Saginaw River. Um, and if you look here, you can sort of see the footprint of the reef in that bottom right image. It's a two acre reef or 0.8 hectares of rock. Um, it's roughly halfway up the water column. It's about five meter depth. So it's roughly three meters at peak height. Um, and they used half granite and half limestone for their application. Um, so following that restoration, I started as a PhD student at Purdue and I covered this sort of post restoration assessment of utilization. Um, so here just sort of a crude map just to sort of um, contextualize the different locations that we sampled. Uh, you can see that, or maybe you can see that parallelogram uh, where we sampled both the northeastern granite half as well as the southwestern limestone half of directly on the restored reef. But we also sampled different components adjacent to the reef as well as roughly a kilometer to the south at a control site. Um, what we found, we used the same standardized methods and gear types as, pre, as the pre-restoration surveys so we could try to compare capture rates, egg deposition rates, egg predation, etc. during pre and post surveys. Um, here these, or these uh, plots are showing along the y-axis just the mean catch per unit effort or catch per net um, above our lake whitefish and below our walleye. If, when you're looking left to right, if you can see colors, um, 2014, 2015, 2015, and 2016, those are pre-restoration values, and these colored values below are my post-restoration values. Roughly, we saw no increasing sort of pattern of more spawners at the reef uh, following the restoration, so it's been roughly consistent. And again, we saw that more walleye were using the habitat than Lake Whitefish in their respective spawning periods. Um, that's not quite the same case for egg deposition rates though. Um, here, again, above our whitefish and below our walleye, and this time along the y-axis, you can see the peak uh, egg deposition. I'll point out that these are natural log transformed, um, so these differences are actually even greater as raw data, but we saw, especially in walleye, a great uptick in peak egg deposition directly on the reef following that restoration. We saw sort of a marginal increase of deposition for like whitefish, but it was especially prominent <coughs> for walleye. Um, third, we saw sort of a different assemblage of egg predator species or potential egg predators utilizing the habitat when compared to the pre-restoration survey. So um, before there was any sort of reef habitat uh, augmented or added at Corian, it was generally a flat sandy bottom and so that obviously had a different assemblage of species that utilized it, but once you brought in that granite and limestone rock, it appeared that round gobies quickly sort of um, adopted the reef as well. And so I would say most predominantly in our surveys, we found a pretty high number of round gobies, and when looking at stomach contents, they most prolifically consumed uh, walleye eggs. So here in this picture, there are roughly maybe 100 walleye eggs that were found in the gut of a round goby. Unlike the pre-restoration surveys, uh, we did not find any sort of concerning trends or patterns in dissolved oxygen. So um, we set our archival loggers over winter, uh, the winters of 2020, 2021, and 2022. Um, 
And here, this y-axis is the um, dissolved oxygen per milligram liter. And you might see you know, some sort of downward uh, spikes here and there. But I'll just point out that uh, even the lowest minimum value we found was well above any threshold um, for concern or of hypoxia in the area. I will point out that we were sampling directly on top of the reef, but it's, po it's possible that the actual egg environment within the interstitial, interstitial spaces or cracks of the rocks may be slightly different. Um, oh, and then finally, we found no actual differences between the granite or limestone halves of the reef. Um, just a quick note, um, we also took genetic samples of all the walleye that we captured on, on Corian Reef, and we found a bit of an interesting pattern um, where the, the walleye that were utilizing Corian Reef seem to be genetically distinct from the walleye that are spawning in the Titabawassee River, which is one of the main um, sort of recruitment sources of, Sagana of the Saginaw Bay population. Um, so here, this image, this is showing um, just general clustering based on 500 loci in a genetic analysis. And what we found was that the Titabawassee River uh, walleye were most similar to Muskegon River, which makes sense given that there is a roughly 30 year stocking program um, that was sourced by a lot of Muskegon River fish. Um, but the walleye that we um, sequenced from Corian Reef actually appeared more similar to those from Western Lake Erie. So it's, potent it's possible that these types of reef restorations may enhance um, some smaller uh, genetic, or it could enhance genetic diversity of the stock, I will say. Um, and then I will point out that there's going to be uh, currently ongoing uh, pre-restoration surveys much closer to the river mouth, um, just outside of Spoils Island, as well as at the Kaukon River mouth. Those will be going spring uh, this year, spring next year, as well as fall 24. Um, in fact, I'll be getting on the water tomorrow, so if you happen to catch yourself on the bay, you may see the Purdue boat. Um, and then one last note, throughout all of these habitat surveys, we have also um, deployed an array of archival dissolved oxygen loggers throughout the entire bay. Um, and although we didn't find concern for hypoxia over winter at Corian Reef, I just wanted to point out, um, it's sort of a neat finding, Justin Meyer is the master student who recently defended. Um, he was leading this project. We did three th see throughout the summer in August 21 and 22 um, during extended low wind uh, or wave periods. We did see some evidence of hypoxia, those sort of red areas on these plots in the deeper areas of Saginaw Bay. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Ryan. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm Ryan Darnton. I'm an engineer with the NOAA Restoration Center uh, based in Ann Arbor. Uh, and so I'm going to pull back a little bit now. We've been talking about the specific restor reef restoration actions in Saginaw Bay. We're going to talk a bit about the sort of lake-wide efforts at habitat restoration. Um, so I'll direct folks, if you're interested, the NOAA Restoration Atlas is a good resource. Um, each one of these shovels is a restoration project. And um, on the website, you can click on these and pull up data, metrics about the projects, how they were funded, timeline. Um, and uh, this shows projects that were funded through the NOAA Restoration Center um, through a number of different uh, programs, including the Natural Resource Damages, which is uh, related to Superfund activities, as well as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, Inflation Reduction Act, Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, all projects funded through the Restoration Center from all those programs are available. Um, information about them is available on the Atlas. Uh, so for today, I'm going to focus primarily on projects that were active in the, within the last five years. Um, and then I should note that this is, while I'm talking about stuff on the U.S. side, there has been some activity on the Canadian side as well. Um, I know there's been some activity. Um, Manitoulin Streams has been doing some work up uh, on the northern end of the lake. And um, there's also been some strategic land acquisitions uh, by Parks Canada and some NGOs as well. Um, just pulling back farther, for those of you that are here for some of the other lakes, um, the Restoration Atlas has in, um, projects throughout all of the lakes uh, as well. Um, and you may notice that many of those projects were, um, over the last decade, were focused on addressing beneficial use impairments in areas of concern. Um, but more recently, the um, funding opportunities have included uh, the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission's environmental priorities as part of the review, review criteria for identifying projects. So just a quick refresher on the fish community objectives for Lake Huron, um, protect and enhance fish habitat and rehabilitation, uh, rehabilitate degraded habitats, 
achieve no net loss of production capacity of habitat supporting Lake Huron fish communities and support reduction of elimination of contaminants. Um, this led to the development of the um, environmental priorities, which uh, include sort of four categories, uh, dam management and fish passage restoration, reef restoration, coastal wetland habitat restoration and reconnection, and in-stream in rest, uh, habitat restoration and enhancement. And I think, you know, we've talked a bit about the reef already, and as we go through these other projects, I think you'll see that um, we're hopefully hitting some of those targets. So the first project I'm going to talk about um, is the uh, Hamilton Dam removal on the Flint River. Um, Hamilton Dam is the first barrier above uh, on the Flint River above Saginaw Bay. Um, this dam removal is part of a, <coughs> excuse me, a larger project. Um, In-river components uh, are expected to open nearly 25 miles of streams uh, and improve in-channel habitat. Um, the, currently in design and targeting 2024 to start construction. Uh, and you can see that the picture on the top right there is indicating so the dam is going to come out. It's going to be replaced with a series of riffles uh, running through downtown Flint. Um, moving farther north to the Thunder Bay River, uh, this was a partnership with Huron Pines and the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians, um, replacing a series of culverts along Thunder Bay River as well as Gilchrist Creek and Hunt Creek. The photo on the top there is uh, the, a new bridge at Harwood Road on Gil Gilchrist Creek. So if you can picture before, this was three parallel culverts that were undersized and were creating a barrier to aquatic organism passage. They've been replaced by this clear span span bridge. The bottom photo is a bridge at Hall Road. This is on Thunder Bay River, um, which similarly um, is now you have a clear span replacing a series of culverts. Um, there's also been projects at Lutz Road and Hostler Road that are currently in progress and a project at Schmal Schmaller's Road um, that was is already complete. Um, the Little Rapids project in St. Mary's River. Um, this was actually completed in 2015, but I want to mention it because there's some on, ongoing data connection, uh, collection occurring. So photo on the right was the um, causeway that was there before. The photo on the, or sorry, on the left, the photo on the right is the Clear Spring Bridge that is replacing it to uh, restore water flow to the historic rapids. Um, the biological data was collected before construction in 2013 and 2014, and then again after construction in 2017, 2018, and was published in a paper uh, in 2021 that observed a 45% increase in richness of larval fish and 131% increase in catch per unit effort. Um, also, we're oftentimes we're not able to have uh, post restoration funding that extends out several years, but for this particular project, we identified some funding. We're going to go back and collect additional data um, in 2024 and 2025. We'll hopefully be able to compare back to the um, 2017 and 2018 data and the pre-restoration data. So we'll have a bit more of a timeline in terms of effectiveness of the restoration activities. And then lastly, I'll talk uh, just a little bit about the Black River. Um, this is a partnership, again, with the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians. Um, they uh, were awarded funding to uh, look at up to 12 different fish passage barriers. Uh, this includes the um, tower uh, in, engaging in the um, relicensing efforts to, uh, at the tower and cleaver dams. Um, that work is still underway, um, but there is the first of the projects that's been completed, and that's the Spar Road Crossing, and photo on the top is the culverts that were there before, and photo on the bottom is the new uh, Clear Spring Bridge. Uh, and so I just want to say thank you, obviously, for all of these projects. You heard me name several other partners. Um, you know, we have the Restoration Center in the Great Lakes has a relatively small office, so the ability to execute these projects is totally dependent on all of our partners. We really appreciate that. And that's all I have. Thanks.